Hello everybody. <laughs> hey guys. Uh, they say the, the phrase that's used most on the internet when people are introducing uh, themselves is, hey guys. So I'm saying, hey guys. And now I have to check my monitor to make sure that uh, we are on uh, Facebook. And it looks like I'm on. And now I've got to copy that over to the church page. And so bear with me. And I'm going to put it over on the CFC page. And post it. Paste, continue, publish. All right, so it's posting, posted. Now, this should be going live on the CFC. There it is. Boy, the color is, uh, the, the light is really bad um, on that one. Let me go back to my page and see what we've got here. Uh, that doesn't look, well, it looks just the same as the other one. Um, all right. Oh, Torsha, faithful ever. <laughs> Good to have you with us tonight. Um, the lighting is much worse on my little monitor screen than it is on my big monitor screen. Um, I'm not sure why, but, uh, she said, the lighting is okay. Okay, well, thank you for that. I appreciate it. I depend on you guys to kind of let me know if, if uh, something's not working right or the sound's not right. <clears throat> I'm going to check the sound here real quick to make sure that we've got volume. Testing one, two. Testing one, two. I could go up a little bit higher. All right, testing one, two. Testing one, two. It looks good. All right, praise God. Carol Thornton. Oh, Carol. Praise the Lord. I'm going to look down like this. I've got things closer to me than I normally do. And so I have to kind of back up and look and see what's going on. Uh, we are uh, in our uh, makeshift studio right now. At um, uh, This is the Marriott Residence Inn in South Tulsa uh, on 71st Street, if anybody cares. Um, so we've kind of turned this into a makeshift studio and if you see stuff in the background ignore it because we've got a lot of stuff in here uh, we moved in here Saturday night and I say moved in just temporary believe me uh, we've been looking for houses every day uh, I haven't rented a house in a lot of years over 12 years and so I don't didn't know how difficult it could be to rent a house and uh, anyway we're believing God for a house so believe with us and we believe we, we saw one today that was, oh, we loved it. Uh, it wasn't for sale or for lease, but that can change. Anyway, so we're looking all over Tulsa. We're looking in Broken Arrow and Jinx, which is south of the river. And um, I went, well, it's actually, well, I guess it'd be west. So I'm kind of turned around here in Oklahoma. Um, I think it would be southwest uh, of, t of Tulsa downtown uh, but it's a good area apparently and uh, we've been told good things about it broken arrows near rama we like that area so we're looking all over trying to find something we will find something in the name of jesus so continue to pray for us please i want to get out of the hotel here and uh, praise god we have this um, temporarily but um, it's not our favorite we um, you know we got one bedroom a bath a little kitchenette and we're in the living room <laughs> and I don't want to show you all that. So, praise God. Thank you for being with us again tonight. Um, we are endeavoring to keep our promise to uh, continue to teach and do the Bible study and do the Sunday morning service. By the way, I found my computer and I found the, the plug, the power, the, what, the power converter, whatever it is, and I found the keyboard. And um, I, I think Sunday morning we'll have that up and running which means we can do worship. And so I'm looking forward to that. Uh, as soon as we get into a house, we'll set up our regular studio and uh, we're gonna do a lot of good things there, but we're gonna do good things until then too. Now, because I don't have a printer, I can't print out my notes. So I'm using Mary's iPad to see my notes here. That's why I'm getting a white light coming up this way. And the, the uh, light coming from this direction is just the wall light at the hotel here. 
And so if the lighting's not too good, you understand why. Uh, anyway, I want to start with Psalm 91 like we normally do, and I'm going to do my best to read it uh, with the light that's available. And uh, this is a good confession. I believe you're going to continue to confess this, uh, not just now, not just during the COVID situation, but uh, ongoing. Amen. So Psalm 91 is a confession of faith for all of us. We dwell in the secret place of the Most High. We shall remain stable and fixed under the shadow of the Almighty, whose power no foe can withstand. We will say of the Lord, He is our refuge, our fortress, our God. On Him we lean and rely, and in Him we confidently trust. Therefore, He will deliver us from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover us with His pinions, and under His wings shall we trust and find refuge. His truth and His faithfulness are a shield and a buckler to us. We shall not be afraid of the terror of the night, nor the arrows, the evil plots, the slanders of the wicked that flies by day, nor of the pestilence that stalks in darkness, nor of the destruction and sudden death that surprise and lay waste at noonday. A thousand may fall at our side and ten thousand at our right hand, but it shall not come near us. Only a spectator shall we be, ourselves inaccessible in the secret place of the Most High as we witness the reward of the wicked. Because we have set, because we have made the Lord our refuge and the Most High our dwelling place, there shall no evil befall us, nor any plague or calamity come near our dwelling or our families in the name of Jesus. For he will give his angels charge over us to accompany and defend and preserve us in all of our ways of obedience and service. They shall... Uh, they, they shall bear us up on their hands, lest we dash our foot against the stone. We shall tread upon the lion and the adder, the young lion and the serpent, shall we trample underfoot. Because we have set our love upon him, therefore he will deliver us. He will deliver us. He will, be, he will set us on high because we know and understand his name and have a personal knowledge of his mercy, love, and kindness, and trust and rely on him, knowing he will never forsake us, no Never we shall call upon him. He will answer us. He will be with us in trouble. He will deliver us and honor us. With long life will he satisfy us and show us his salvation. Amen, amen, amen. Hallelujah. I, I managed to read that whole thing with uh, hardly much light here. Now, if I turn it this way, I can read it. <laughs> Praise God. We're doing our best here. All right. Uh, we're on um, Facebook. On my page, we're on Facebook, on the church page, uh, we're on um, Instagram, and then after we're done here, I'm going to copy this and put it over on Gab. Uh, by the way, if you're trying to find Gab, it's uh, black background, white lettering, G-A-B with a plus sign, uh, and we're getting two to 3,000 views of each of our services or Bible studies uh, every week consistently. So we're getting the greatest um, viewership on GAM. Um, we haven't had a lot of feedback yet, but uh, that's coming. I believe it's going to be good feedback too. Amen? By the way, I want to ask all of you, however you're watching, uh, if it's following, if it's subscribing, like on YouTube, I'm going to ask you to go to my YouTube channel, Pastor William Emmons. Make sure you see my face. And uh, subscribe. It's free. It doesn't cost anything. You can go back for five years in the archives there and you can uh, watch and listen to all the studies that we've done, all of our Sunday morning services. Uh, so you can take advantage of that free of charge. Uh, so follow, subscribe, uh, whatever the term is that uh, links you to us. Uh, now on Facebook, I've been told that some people have been blocked and I don't know why because we haven't blocked them. Uh, so if uh, you're having trouble with Facebook, uh, friend us again or do a friend we request to us so we can uh, accept your friend request and, and friend you back. Uh, that will uh, hopefully keep us linked on Facebook. So uh, enough of the business. Uh, I've got my, my iced tea <laughs> and I'm ready to go. Um, let's see who else here. Carol Thornton, Torsha. Uh, and usually Karina's on, and there's a few others that I can't see. Now, I don't know if you can see the words coming up on the screen, 
I can see it on my monitor and I have no idea why that's happening and how to shut it off. So Holy Spirit's going to have to show me or send me somebody to tell me how to shut those words off because they may misinterpret something I say. <laughs> All right. Um, tonight's message, if you got the notes, if you're a partner with us, I try to send out notes for every service. Uh, if you're not a partner with us, you know, become a partner by all means. But um, the title of tonight's message is Faith Plus Works Makes the Word Prevail. We've been talking about the prevailing word now for the last, oh, probably three weeks. And oh, no, show, no word showing on this end. All right, thank you, Torsha. I appreciate that. I wonder why I'm getting it. Anyway, as long as they're not there, that's good. Uh, so faith plus works make the word prevail. This is part of the deeper walk series we're doing this year where I'm taking you further and further and further into the depth of the Word of God uh, with uh, teaching revelation insight uh, by the Holy Spirit. So what I give you tonight most of what I've got here is scripture and what I've been doing is just reading the scripture and letting the Holy Spirit give me what I'm to say and bring forth that revelation and insight that will help you. So I'm going to start off with 1 John 5, 4 from the Amplified Translation. I'm looking this way because that's where the notes are right now. Uh, for whatever is born of God is, I want you to get that tense, whatever is born of God is, present tense, victorious over the world, the world system. Now I know back in California, now that we're in Tulsa, I have to look back and find out what's happening in California. I know they're trying to put, make you go backwards right now and wear masks again. And um, I know with the liberal governor there, what's going on. Uh, but you know what? Whatever's born of God is victorious over the world. It doesn't matter what the world's trying to do. Excuse me. I got a piece of almond in my mouth. <laughs> anyway. Um, and this is the victory that overcomes the conquers. And I like this Amplified Translation. This is the victory that conquers the world, even our faith. It's your faith that conquers the world. You can know all the word. You can, you can memorize the entire Bible. And I've, I've met people who you would think they, they have done that because they can quote scripture after scripture, uh, just one right after another, you know. <clears throat> but that's not where revelation comes from. It's not knowing it in here. It's having a revelation of it in here. And so he says, uh, and this is the victory, the victory that conquers the world, even our faith. So the, here's the question that you have to ask yourself. Do I really have much faith or am I operating in faith? Uh, you may have uh, a fair amount of faith because faith is a variable and by that I simply mean that the Bible says it has been dealt unto every man the measure the measure a not not a measure but the like there's uh, one measure we all got it and the only difference between you me and anybody else is what we do with it and then we know faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God so the way we build faith is not just listening to somebody preach or listening to it on a CD or an MP3 or something like that. The way we build faith is that we personally get into the Word and begin to declare the promises of God over our lives, over our situations, our families, our finances, our businesses, whatever it might be. As you speak the Word of God, the Holy Spirit comes along and begins to speak to you about the Word He's hearing out of your mouth. And then, of course, we know that as God created everything with words and, and uh, he taught Adam how to do that, and then Abraham was commended, even in the book of Hebrews, because it says he was like God, who spoke of things that be not as though they are. So Abraham was speaking words, even when, when, when he was telling people, you know, introducing himself as Abraham, you know, my name is Abraham, you know, and shake hands or whatever. Uh, that that statement, the name Abraham, uh, means father of a multitude, uh, and so when he's speaking that, he had not he, for 14 years he didn't have any uh, any children, and yet he was saying, "I'm the father of a multitude. I'm a father of a multitude." He was speaking something that didn't yet exist, as though it had, and that's the way God spoke. 
when God said light be, there wasn't any light. But God said light be, and boom, there was light. Amen? So we've got to learn to do the same thing. And, and when we say we're moving by faith, we need to understand that moving by faith is not just believing God, not just believing in something, not just believing Scripture. But walking by faith is an active uh, participation with God and His Word by the Holy Spirit as we declare it and then we walk it out. We become doers of the Word, not just hearers only. Amen? Amen. Now, I want to read that same verse to you, 1 John 5, 4, from the Passion Translation. You see, every child of God overcomes the world. So stop right there. If you're born again, you're a child of God. And God has declared you overcome the world. You overcome the opposition. You overcome the lies of the devil. You overcome what the, what the government may be trying to do. Uh, it, it doesn't really matter what the world tries to do. No weapon formed against us will prosper. No evil shall befall us. We read Psalm 91 there. That's the promise of God. That's a covenant promise, and you're a covenant person. Amen. So he says, you see, every child of God overcomes the world. For our faith is the victorious power that triumphs over the world. So if you want to triumph, if you want to walk in victory, then you need to develop your faith. Now, you might say, well, Pastor, it seems like you preach on these same things all the time. Well, it seems that way because everything you study in the Word of God has a connection to the things I'm sharing with you right now. So no matter what subject, no what, what direction we may go, the bottom line is it's going to come back to walking by faith, it's going to come back to talking faith, come back to speaking or declaring the Word of God over a situation, and being a doer of the Word. Those are the basic things that we have to do if we're going to walk in the great blessings of God. We, um, we've had so many things happen on this trip uh, getting here. Uh, our Ford Explorer was pulling an 8 by 12 uh, trailer loaded, literally loaded. If you open up the back end, things started falling out. Uh, and that's not even the bulk of our household items. You don't realize how much stuff you've got after you've been married 50 years and lived in one place for at least, you know, like we did, 12 years in one place. Things just accumulate, and you don't even realize it until you start moving, and all of a sudden, oh my Lord, does this ever end? That's the way I said, I walked in the last day when we were supposed to be leaving in the morning. Every time I went back in the house, it, was, it seemed like there was more stuff. Where did that come from? Well, that was upstairs. Well, that was in the other room. Well, that was, you know, and, and it's, I said, I finally made the statement and said, will it never end, you know? Well, we had to make an end of it. We had to pack what we could pack and, and leave, you know? Uh, we had made a commitment and we couldn't keep on just hanging on, hanging on, hanging on. And uh, so we, we actually left some things. Uh, we trimmed some things down, you know, trimmed some things out of our lives. And uh, we finally got on the road. And praise God, we couldn't drive more than 50 miles an hour. Normally I'd be up in the speed limit uh, which most of the country on the road is 75 miles an hour and you can go, uh, I know people go 80, 85 and don't get tickets because they allow you some flexibility. So normally I'd be up there in that 75 to 80 bracket, but because of the trailer, we could only go 50 miles an hour. But what that meant was it took us longer to get here, but we had more time to see the countryside. So <laughs> we cruised along and saw things along the way and enjoyed the weather and the different times of the day and night we were driving. Uh, but that car made it all the way here, pulled that trailer like a champ. We finally got it off yesterday, spent the day unpacking that trailer into a storage space at U-Haul. And now the, the, it's like the car went back to teenage years and it's spunky and ready to go again. Anyway, I said all that because we've, we've been experiencing blessing after blessing after blessing, uh, not just on the trip. I mean, way before we began when we first made the decision that we felt God was speaking to us to make this change, the blessings began and they have not stopped. And, and uh, I'd like to write them down sometime and, and share them all with you because as I'm talking, I'm not thinking about some of the things that have happened even most recently, just these last few days that we've been here. But it's been such a blessing. But the blessings 
are not automatic. And you need to understand, just because you're born again, just because you say, I believe the word, just because you say, you know, I, I, I believe the Lord and I believe in the blessings, I believe in the covenant, those do not trigger the blessings. It's walking by faith that releases the blessings because faith is the force, he says, that overcomes the world. And so we know how faith comes. We got to do the things that build our faith. Meditate the word of God. Declare the word of God. Walk by faith. Be a doer of the word. Amen? All right. So our faith is the victorious power that triumphs over the world. Now, the word spoken in faith, the word of God spoken in faith. Now, what does that mean? Well, we used to call that a confession of faith, but you know, confessing the word of God got a dirty uh, rap. You know, it, uh, people started saying, I don't believe in that confession stuff, you know. Well, God does. <laughs> but what the Lord spoke to me was, he said, you're making a declaration of faith. When you confess the word, just like we did with the 91st Psalm, he said, you are making a declaration of faith over your circumstance, over your life, over your family, over your finances, over your health, your body. And every declaration of faith is, is a challenge to the devil. You're telling him, devil, I'm not going to settle for sickness and disease and lack and want. I'm not going to settle for things happening to my family. I'm not going to settle for COVID-19 or whatever the number is, or the variant now they claim. You know what? God's already made provision for all that. There's already a cure in place. And all we've got to do is, is learn how to put God first in our lives and trust his word and watch him show us the things that need to be done. Amen? Amen. In, um, so what I started to say is the word spoken out in faith and acted on is what causes the word to prevail in your life. When you are declaring the word over your situation and then acting or walking that out with corresponding actions, the word prevails because you are giving that word authority to prevail over your life. And so when I say I'm redeemed from the curse, I'm healed by the stripes of Jesus, I'm giving the word authority to prevail over the opposite things that are trying to come against me. Yesterday I was talking to a young man at, um, at uh, 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 U-Haul and we got to talking and I guess he was talking to his, his friend on, he had an earpiece in, he was, and they were talking and he came up and we started talking and his friend was hearing everything. And I won't tell you the, the word he used, but uh, he, he said, that guy sounds like a bad, and you fill in the blanks. Because we were talking about walking by faith and believing God and how at my age, you know, uh, <laughs> at any age, it doesn't matter. But when you're in your 70s and in your 80s, the world says, oh, you're, you're, you're going through the downhill side of life. You, it's that aging, dying process. But that's under the curse. So I told him, I said, when I told him I was 72, he said, no, you can't be. You don't look older than 50. I said, well, I appreciate that. <laughs> I said, the thing that you've got to understand about walking, and I was sharing this with him as a Christian. And uh, I said, I don't know what you know about the new birth or being born again. And I, I went through all that. I said, but what you have to understand is the world and the world's way of thinking does not have to control our lives. And I said, the reason why at 72, I can still walk and live and do and enjoy things I, I've done since I was a teenager. Uh, you know, I, I, I love uh, physical sports. Uh, I love to surf. That's one of my favorite things. But there's other things I, I like as well. And I don't have any problem, uh, you know, getting out with the, with the grandkids and playing a little bit of basketball with them and so forth. You know, somebody said, oh, what if you have a heart attack? Well, what if I don't? So you've got to change your mentality. You know, I mean, if the devil tries to kill me and, and ends up somehow being successful, hey, I'm with the Lord. I mean, I, I haven't lost anything. But that's not going to happen. The reason is, the Bible says, and here's what I declare, the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Hey, Doris. Hey, Karina. Praise God. Willie, praise God. You made it. Hallelujah. Uh, I, I guess you're not blocked anymore. I don't, I, I don't know if you were blocked. or. We've had a lot of people say that somehow they've not been able to get the, 
the live stream. Uh, so I, I believe God that that's being lifted and people are being able to hear. It's good to have it anyway. Uh, so I was telling him the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. The law of sin and death is that aging, dying process that came as a result of the curse when Adam and Eve fell. All right, but Christ redeemed us from the curse, Galatians three thirteen. So I'm redeemed from anything that is the result of the fall. So the law of the spirit of life, which is in Christ Jesus, is He in you? Are you born again? Mary's back there shaking her head. You know, I can see her head bouncing up and down. She gets as much out of this. Her and I probably get more out of this than anybody else. Because when I teach and preach the Word of God, it, it encourages me, it charges me, and it does her too. So I'm preaching to myself, if nothing else. Anyway, the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus, if you're born again, that law is in you, but you've got to set it, you've got to release that law to work in your life. And it set me free from the law of sin and death, which is what came when the fall happened. So you've got to begin to declare that over your life. I also take that scripture daily as medicine, uh, that uh, my youth is renewed daily. That's, that's a Bible promise. So my youth is renewed daily, and I declare it this way. Every cell, every tissue, every organ in my body is renewed daily. My mind is renewed daily. My heart is renewed daily. My, my arteries are renewed daily in the name of Jesus. And I declare that my arteries are clear and that, uh, that, that there's no plaque buildup and blockages of any kind. And, and I have a strong, healthy heart. That's every cell, every tissue, every organ in my body. Renewed daily. Amen? And I, ta I, I declare that I have perfect mental recall, that I, that I should have no diminish, uh, diminishing of my mental faculties as I get older because the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Am I talking too fast? <laughs> I don't know if it's the iced tea or I'm just charged right now. Uh, anyway, Luke chapter 17, verse 6 from the King James Translation. And the Lord said, If you had faith as a grain of mustard seed, you might, or actually correctly translated, you would say, If you had faith, let's, let's shorten it to, so you can get it. If you had faith, you would say. Say what? Say what God has promised you. David talks about in his writings, I will recount the promises of God. I will remember the promises of God. I will declare the promises of God. David was talking about what we call confession or a declaration of the, uh, the faith of God in our lives. By the way, that's God's faith in you. It works. Praise God. Amen. So if you had faith, you would say, and here he's talking about unto the sycamine tree, uh, be thou plucked up by the root, and be thou planted in the sea, and it should. And actually, again, cross that out and put would. It would or will obey you. You say, well, I've spoken to things like that, and I haven't seen anything happen like that. Well, we have, and we do, and so I'm going to go with the word. <laughs> Mary, Mary read the scripture about Jesus speaking to the fig tree, and we had a tree outside of our a window uh, in our dining room window and the front door porch was right next to it and this silly tree man uh, it seemed like it bloomed all year long you know and these these purple flowers that they would stick to your shoes and, and you'd walk in the house and it would make the carpet black and we had to take our shoes off all the time to keep from getting it on the carpet and Mary finally said I'm, I'm, I'm done with that I'm fed up with it I'm not gonna put up with that anymore and she spoke to that tree and I'm telling you, one day, I, I noticed that that tree started drying up. And I said, Mary, I, I think that tree is dying. And uh, she said, well, I spoke to it, and I told it it couldn't put flowers all over our, our steps anymore. And sure enough, within weeks, that thing dried up. It just literally went bare. And they finally came along and cut it down. And what's funny is, when she spoke to it, directly across the way was another one, and they both dried up and died. Now, out of all the complex, we only saw those two trees die. Mary spoke to them, just like Jesus said, if you speak to it. Amen. Now, um, I'm looking at my, I just saw a sign here that says battery is low. Give me a moment here. Uh, let me turn this. Well, it's um, got.
got some juice left. I'm going to kind of keep an eye on it. All right. I have to run off battery banks here. I don't have enough cords to go around all of our electronic devices, except the ones I'm using are packed away still. All right. So um, you would say the sick of mind tree, and it should obey you. Now, let me explain something. There's two things being talked about there. There is faith, and there was the object. All right. So he talks about the object, and, he and that's the sycamine tree. But then he's also talking about faith. And the Bible says faith is a servant for us. Faith is a servant. I won't get into all the scripture in detail about that tonight. But faith was given to us as God's faith. He gave it to us when we got born again to serve us, to accomplish things for us in our lives. And we go around saying, I don't believe in that faith stuff. I don't believe in that confession stuff. We are contradicting God's plan and purpose for our lives. Because God wants us to walk in victory, not, not in defeat. Amen. So, when it says, Be thou plucked up by the root and cast uh, planted in the sea, it should obey you. It, the servant faith, should obey you. Faith will obey. Faith doesn't know anything but work. It's an energy. Electricity doesn't know anything but when you flip the switch to energize whatever it's hooked to. That's all it knows. It doesn't know anything else. Faith knows creation. Faith knows how to create. Faith knows how to bring things forth into manifestation. That's, that's God's faith. That's what he used to create the universe. So when we apply faith and we begin to declare it, we are simply flipping the switch and releasing the faith of God into our situation. Whether it's healing for our bodies, our minds, our finances, our marriages, our families, our jobs, our businesses, whatever it might be. Hallelujah. The second thing that takes place there when it says it should obey you or it will obey you is the object that faith is being applied to. I spoke to that our car uh, driving here before we ever left the house. And I don't know how many miles it is, 17, 1800 miles from LA to Tulsa. And pulling that heavy trailer, the devil was telling me all kinds of things. Oh, you're going to blow an engine. You're going to blow this, blah, you know, whatever. And I said, nope, bless God. And I laid hands on that car and I said, car, I command you to, if there's anything wrong, anything in there about ready to wear out or break, I command you to heal angels of God. You get in there and fix that thing, whatever it might be, and cause this car to run perfectly the way it's supposed to run in the name of Jesus. And it pulled that heavy trailer up the mountains, down the mountains, through the valleys, <laughs> across the desert, the plains. I mean, you name it, 110, 112 degree temperatures. Uh, just amazing. And uh, when I took the trailer off, like I said, it feels like a new car all of a sudden without the trailer. It... Faith will obey you because it's your servant. When you declare what God said over your situation, faith responds to the word of God. The power, the, the force of faith is energized and released as we declare God's word, God's promise over our situation. Then the object that is applied against has to obey you as well. And here is a sycamine tree. With Jesus, there was a fig tree. There was wind, there was waves, there was, there was um, uh, people that were blind, there were people that, uh, all kinds of things. And whatever it was, when Jesus declared it, it obeyed. Now, you look and say, well, that's Jesus. I mean, after all, he's the son of God. Now, if you go back to Philippians chapter 2, you're going to read something that you may not have really gotten before. In Philippians chapter 2, it declares... Now it's saying low battery again in the name of Jesus. I'm going to switch up uh, my battery pack here. I'm going to take this one that's got three bars showing. I'm going to plug it in to here. And that will bring power back to my, um, that is my Facebook monitor that I'm using the Mevo camera on. So it's working. Praise the Lord. All right. So what was I saying? I <laughs> got interrupted there. Uh, as we as we release faith, uh, we we apply our faith to whatever. Just look at Jesus. Philippians chapter two is what I was going to. Jesus, it says, as, as an act of his own will, 
stripped himself of deity. Now you got to go back and re read it from the Passion Translation. Read it. Amplified will give you a bit of insight and, and the uh, New International Version. I like to go through. I've got about six versions uh, on my iPad here. And Torsha says Philippians chapter 3. There you go. I thought it was chapter 2. <laughs> anyway, I like to go through different translations and get the full picture. And when you got it on your, your electronic device, it's so simple to click and, and read, click and read, you know, not flipping pages looking for stuff. So uh, when, I, when I look at that, he, he became a man. He humbled himself, an act of his will, stripped himself of his deity. And the Bible says he became a man. And he lived as a man. He didn't live as the son of God. He, he said, I'm the son of man. He called himself the son of man. He was born of a woman. Uh, how do you become human? You have to be born of a woman. So he, he, he stripped himself of his deity. He was born of a woman, became a man. The, and John wrote about that. And he said the reason why Jesus could exercise divine judgment or divine law in the earth is because he was very man. Paul calls him all man. So we need to understand Jesus didn't do the miracles he did because he was the son of God. He did the miracles that he did because he was a covenant man operating under the Abrahamic or the old covenant which provided all kinds of power and, and, and manifestations of the glory of God. And he was operating under that. Anything Jesus did, he did under that old covenant that Abraham made with God or that God made with Abraham. So when we use that excuse, well, that's Jesus. The Bible says we have better promises now in the new covenant. We have better promises. We have, we have uh, more available to us even than in the Old Testament. Jesus said, not only can you do the things I do, let me ask you a question. How many of you are doing the things that Jesus did? moment of silence here <laughs> ask yourself that how many are doing the things that jesus did when when the lord spoke to us to make this move i really you know questioned it at first and and i asked the lord for wisdom on how to handle things how to continue ministering to our congregation everybody was watching online already and the lord said just keep on doing what you've been doing for the last year and a half Keep ministering to them. They're still your congregation. You're still their pastor. And keep on feeding the sheep. Uh, that's why I'm doing this tonight. All right? But what we... I get, I'm getting notifications here. <laughs> Praise God. All right. Um, when we look at Jesus' ministry, we have to understand when he said the things that I do, you are going to do, and greater things... Now, sometimes it's hard to imagine any of us doing greater things than Jesus did. But Jesus never got anybody born again. He told people, told one guy, you must be born again. But nobody could be born again while he was here in the earth. He had to go to the cross. He had to go into hell and pay the price and, and beat the devil and take back what, the, what Adam lost and give it back to the church. And he had to be raised from the dead and he had to be seated at the right hand of the Father his blood sacrifice had to be accepted in the heavenly holy of holies. So nobody was born again at that point. So if nothing else, if we can do everything Jesus did, plus get people born again, we're doing greater works in just that one act. Hallelujah. But healing the sick, raising the dead, casting out devils, that ought to be routine with us. That ought to be something that, that uh, we just, you know, it's just every day. When I was talking to this young man yesterday, it just it started flowing out of me. And, and once I get started, <laughs> it's hard to stop. Uh, I can preach three hours without a problem. As long as my body can handle it, I can go, man. But I got going with him yesterday and sharing with him. And he said, man, I'm going to follow you online. I'm gonna, I hope you're watching tonight. Uh, I won't mention his name. I don't want to embarrass him, but uh, I hope you're watching. But um, again, getting back to this, Jesus spoke words in faith. When I say in faith, I don't mean just I believe. I'm talking about he spoke words that he expected to happen. When he declared things, he expected them to happen. When he told people to do certain things, 
It was a statement of his faith, a release of the force of faith in him, and he expected results. And he got results. If we would develop an expectation that I expect when I pray for somebody, they will get an answer to that prayer because I prayed and I released my faith. Well, the Bible says, if any two shall agree on earth that's touching anything to ask, it shall be done. If one, if two or more are gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst. One can put a thousand to flight. Two can put 10,000 to flight. Over and over again, we, we read things like that, where it talks about the multiplied power available as we come together in faith. And so when we pray for you, we expect results. We don't expect to hear that, you know, we prayed for somebody for healing and they died. Now that has happened, but we don't expect that. We expect results. We expect that when we pray for financial provision for somebody, that they receive financial provision. When they want a healing within their family uh, or relationship, whatever it may be, we expect to hear the testimony that they received. And many of you watching, you've received multitudes of, of answered prayers through this ministry. And I'm not bragging, I'm just saying, we expect results. We don't pray and hope. Hope <laughs> is future. Oh, I'm hoping and a praying. Well, you're always putting it off the future. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. Hope is your vision. It's what you're shooting for. But faith becomes the substance. Faith is the evidence of things not yet seen. I maybe can't see the results yet, but I, faith is my evidence. I haven't seen us move into a house. We've been here four nights, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday. We've been here four nights already. We haven't yet signed a lease and moved into a house, but my faith says we have our house. My faith says we not only have a house to lease for a time, but my faith says we have our own house that we own. And I'm telling you, God, it's, God's got something special for us. Watching what he's done for us, preparing for this change and this trip, uh, miracle after miracle after miracle. Uh, and God has done it all, and we give him the glory for it. All right. Let's go to, well, I said uh, it was Jesus' words spoken in faith and acted on. Now, there's another key to this, uh, the, this uh, release of faith. Remember, faith plus works makes the word prevail over your life, over your situation. If you don't act on the word of God, if you don't become a doer of the word, then your faith, it, it, it's really not released. Because not only do you have to begin to declare it, you have to have corresponding actions. You have to act like it's true. If I believe I'm healed, I get up and act like I'm healed. I don't lay in bed, moan and groan, and, and, and ask my wife to take care of me and, and cool my fevered brow because I feel so down, I'm so bad. No, I get up, I put on my clothes, and I do what I've got to do because I'm walking by faith and I'm believing God. Amen? So Jesus' word spoken to faith and acted on is what caused the word to prevail in his life and in his ministry. John chapter 2, verse 1, uh, actually verses 1 through 11 out of the King James translation. And the third day there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. And both Jesus, I'm sorry, and both Jesus was called and his disciples to the marriage. And when they uh, wanted wine, when the people at this wedding feast wanted wine, the mother of Jesus saith unto him, they have no wine. Jesus saith unto her, woman. Now, that statement in the English translation is kind of, uh, um, uh, you know, deceptive there because the word he spoke to her was very reverential, very respectful. It was his mother he's talking to. And, and so if you read other translations, you'll find that out. But here it says, woman, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come. His mother saith, now, now he, get this, this is a mother, right? She, she ignores what he says in that sense. And he tells the servants, do whatever he says. Just do what he says. All right. So the mother said unto the servants, whatever he saith unto you, do it. And there was set there six water pots of stone after the manner of the purifying of the Jews concerning two or three firkins apiece. Jesus saith unto, unto them, fill the water pots with water. 
and they filled them up to the brim. He saith unto them, Draw out now, and bear unto the governor of the feast, and they, they bear it, or they did it. So here, they're saying, we're out of wine for our celebration, our marriage celebration. Jesus says, fill the water pots. But we're not out of water. We, we, we got plenty of water. We're out of wine. But something happened between the time the water pot got filled and they dipped out and took some to the manager of the feast and he tasted it because it turned to wine. And based on his response, we know that it was the best wine because he, he says uh, he went to the, uh, I don't know if it was the husband or the bridegroom. And uh, he said, you know, in most weddings, they save, uh, you know, they, they uh, serve the best wine and, and then they, you know, after people have had a few drinks, then they serve the cheap wine. He said, but you save the best for last. So it must have been some kind of good stuff, <laughs> but it was the best. So in verse 9, when the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine and knew not whence it was, in other words, he didn't know where it came from, but the servants which drew the water, they knew. The governor of the feast called the bridegroom and saith unto him, Every man at the beginning doth set forth the good wine, and when men have well drunk, then that which is worse. But thou hast kept the good wine until now. This beginning of miracles did Jesus in Cana of Galilee and manifested forth his glory, and his disciples believed on him. All right, so Jesus expected results wouldn't it be kind of embarrassing to say well go fill the water pots with uh water and then take some to the manager of the feast and the manager comes over and says why are you giving me water would that be embarrassing no when jesus see he he had a vision of that water turning to wine i don't mean a vision like i see a vision he had it in his heart that's where he was going with his faith and so he spoke, but it wasn't until they dipped in as an act of faith in what he said, based on what his mother said to do, and whatever he says, do it, you know. They said, okay, so they dipped in and they, you know, all they knew was we put water in there, and I don't know if it happened when they pulled it out and they looked and saw that it was wine, or was it when he handed it to the manager of the feast to taste, but somewhere in that process, of filling the water pot and getting to the manager of the feast, that water, Jesus, turned into wine. There was a miracle. Now the works, the works, you know, faith without works is dead, right? Jesus declared something, told him something, instructions, and expected results. The works were the corresponding actions where he told them, now go take it to the manager of the feast and let him taste it. If, it was, if he expected it to just be water, uh, then you know it would never have been turned to wine. They would never have exclaimed, well, we saved the best for last or whatever. He expected it to be turned to wine. Otherwise, he wouldn't have had them fill the water pots. Amen? All right, I got a few more minutes. Let's go to Mark chapter 8, verse 22 verse, through verse 25. And he cometh to Bethsaida, and they bring a blind man unto him, and besought him to touch him. And he took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the town. And when he had spit on his eyes, what? <laughs> what? Jesus spit on his eyes? Are you kidding me? Do you know? <laughs> I, I kind of feel like the way, the reason why he took him out of town, he didn't want all these unbelievers to watch him do that because they would have gotten in an uproar and, and tried to stone him or something, you know. So he took him aside, took him out of, out of the sight of people. He spit on his eyes and put his hands on him and asked him if he saw aught. In other words, do you see anything? And he looked up and said, I see men as trees walking. They were, they were blurry, they were out of focus, but he saw something which he had not seen before. After that, Jesus put his hands on him again, upon his eyes, and made him look up. And he was restored, and, and I, but I was, but I was determined. If that demon said one thing, thing I'm, I'm, I'm commanding, commanding him to come out, out in, the in the name of Jesus. Jesus. Say, why didn't you just do it? Well, you know what? Sometimes you have to have a response for you to act on. Sometimes the, the person has to uh, have a decision in their own heart that they're going to respond to what you have to say. And you, you know, you gotta take each situation separately. They're not all alike. 
this is what I felt impressed to do. And I was prepared. I was not going to let that demon talk to me. And if he did, I was going to cast him out. That woman disappeared from the time it took to go in and get our drinks and come out. She was gone. Didn't see her again. You've got to always be prepared. I believe that a de if a demon wants to deal with me, he's losing his home in this, in this natural body of that person. I'm casting him out in the name of Jesus. You've got to make some decisions ahead of time. You've got to, like Jesus, had to see the end result from the beginning. When he, when he told him to fill the water pots in his heart, he had to see them, that water turning to wine. When he took this blind man out and spit on him and put his hands on him, he expected his eyes to open, his sight to come back. Amen? Let's go to Luke 8, 22. I'm, I'm running out of time here. Luke 8, 22, verse, uh, 22 through 26. King James translation. Now it came to pass on a certain day that he went into a ship with his disciples and said unto them, let us go over to the other side of the lake. And they launched forth. Now, I want to stop there. Jesus declared something. What did he declare? We're going to the other side. Now, you'd think the disciples, they walk and talk with Jesus. They eat and they sleep. You know, I mean, they, they're around him all the time. And they've seen him do miracle after miracle after miracle. If he said, we're going to the other side, their attitude should have been, we're going to the other side. And they should have been as comfortable and relaxed about it as Jesus was. Now, it says in verse 23, but as they sailed, he fell asleep. And there came down a storm of wind on the lake, and they were, they were filled. Well, the boat, actually, that they were in was filled with water, and they were in jeopardy. In other words, of, of drowning. If Jesus said we're going, now here's how they should have responded. If Jesus said we're going to the other side, then bless God, wind, I rebuke you, waves, I rebuke you, we're going to the other side. They, they didn't even need to bother Jesus. All they had to do was act on what he said. They didn't. They ran to him in fear. They said unto him, what, uh, uh, let's see. They came to him and awoke him saying, Master, Master, we perish. <clears throat> what happened to their faith? They're with the one who had, who was operating in great faith. Any, the same faith they could have operated in. And they come and wake him up and say, we're perishing. We're drowning. <laughs> then he arose and rebuked the wind and the raging of the water. And they ceased. And there was a calm. That's exactly what they should have done. Because he already gave the word. See, once we have the word on it, that's final authority. And that's what they should have accepted. So in verse 25, he said unto them, where's your faith? And they being afraid, wondered, saying one to another, what manner of man is this? For he commandeth even the winds and the water, and they obey him. He already told them, if you had faith as a grain of mustard seed, you would say unto this tree. He already gave them the principle. He already told them how to do what he was doing. And instead, they run to him in fear. We've got to quit running in fear and start moving in faith. Amen? Amen. And they arrived at the country of the Gadarenes, which is over against Galilee. Uh, that's about an eight, six to eight mile trip. Uh, and like that, they were there. I don't know how that happened. Uh, I mean, I, we're out in the middle of one, one moment drowning, and all of a sudden we're at the shore getting off the ship. That had to be some kind of high-speed boat ride after that, praise God. I want to, uh, boy, I, I thought I'd get through this tonight for sure. All right. I want to talk to you for a minute before I wrap things up. Uh, a number of you are partnered with us, and we appreciate it. Uh, you guys are, are helping us do what God has spoken to us to do. And even with this trip, we, we believe with all of our heart that we're in the perfect will of God, that we are doing what he called us to do. And you are involved with that. You are a partner, a part of what we're doing. When we minister to people, you're ministering to people if you're a partner. If you're supporting this ministry, you're a partner with us. Now, if you don't have a home church, and I've said this before, because we have people that don't have a home church, they can't find one in their community that preaches and teaches the word like they're hearing here. And they've made us their pastor, even though it's online. We have an online church. And we appreciate every one of, of those that have become uh, members of our online church. And they've begun to tithe into this ministry. And if you're not tithing, of course, you ought to be. But 
if you are if you have a home church we don't want to take the tithe out of that church but we want you to pray about partnering with us where you commit to a, a monthly support of this ministry so we don't have a physical congregation anymore behind us in the sense that we can go every Sunday morning and, and preach a word and receive tithes and offerings and so forth we're totally dependent upon God speaking to people to support this ministry if we're blessing you then the Bible says if you're taught in the things of God you ought to share in the support of them that do the teaching I'm just giving you what the word says so pray about supporting this ministry to whatever degree whatever level I mean every dollar that comes in we put to work for doing what God's called us to do so uh, we want you to know we're not just out playing we're here on, on a job on an assignment for God and we've got a job to do and we're going to do it and if you partner with us you're going to be partakers of the blessings that God manifests through this ministry. It, it's as if you're right here with us, preaching and teaching and laying hands on the sick and doing the work of God with us because you're a partner. Uh, our partners get special privileges. Not that we don't love all of you, but when people support our ministry, we want to bless them. And as we get settled uh, in our new location here, uh, there's a number of things that we're going to be able to do that we've not been able to do before. Uh, we're going to start sending out blessings to you, and put, you know, whenever God speaks to us to do that. But we pray for you guys every day. I pray for you twice a day when I wake up and when I go to bed. Uh, I hold you up before the Lord. If you've got special requests, you can email us. You can text us. Uh, I mean, there's a number of ways to get. You can leave comments here um, on what you're watching right now. And we go through, we review, we pray. And, and I believe that as Pastor Mary and I pray, we join our faith together with yours, that your prayers, the things you've asked us to pray about, that those get answered, that miracles take place in your life. So by all means, do that. Our email is wemmons one at gmail.com. Feel free to email us. If you got a prayer request, testimonies, we'd love to hear from you. Also, if you want to support this ministry, uh, our PayPal account, that same email is for the PayPal account as well, wemmons one at gmail.com. Uh, if you give that way, be sure to use the friends and family option, which is, I think, after you enter the amount, it goes to the next page, and it's that there that you see the friends and family choice. That way they don't take fees out. Uh, we have a Venmo account. Uh, if you go to, uh, let me give you the way it's, it's at, uh, William with a capital W dash Emmons with a capital E dash 10. So at William dash Emmons dash 10. Capitalize my name, uh, first letter of, you know, of both names, and it'll get through. Just make sure you see my face, and then you know you got the right one. And then uh, let the Lord direct you. If you want to give, uh, you say, well, I want to give, but I'm not sure I can commit, you know, monthly. Well, just start where you're at and do what God impresses upon you to do. And I believe that if you'll do that, that God will bless you, and God will uh, obviously allow you to be a part of what we're doing and help us to accomplish what he's called us to do. So we thank you for partnership. We thank you for those of you that give even uh, occasionally. We appreciate every one of you. If you want to give by check or money order, send it to the same address, Post Office Box 4238, West Hills, California, 91308. Uh, make it out to CFC, and that'll be sufficient. And with that, I, I'm being told I'm out of time. Mary, don't if it stopped, don't touch it. <laughs> Instagram stopped, but Facebook is ongoing. All right, but we're going to let you go now. We love you guys. Appreciate you. We're back Sunday morning, 10 o'clock. Uh, I, I believe I'm going to be able to tell you we're in our new house. Just agree with us on that. And uh, like I said, if you need prayer, send us an email. Let us know.